Hello, my name is Jeff Messier. I'm a professor in electrical and software engineering in the Schulich School of Engineering. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk a little bit about registers. Now, if you've been following along with these lectures in sequence, you might say, oh, registers, right? We already talked about that. They're just a bank of flip-flops that are used to store um, a bunch of bits in parallel. Um, so yeah, that's true. That is one meaning of the word register, but we actually use the term register to refer to a couple of different things in this class. Um, so, and we're gonna talk about some of those other things in this module. The first thing I want to talk about is a, a small sort of high speed section of memory that we are going to re, uh, refer to as the register file. And the register file is basically as I said, uh, uh, a small amount of high speed digital memory located very close to the arithmetic logic unit, which is the um, part of the processor that actually executes commands and, uh, and does calculations. This little bank of high speed memory has um, you know, a, a range of, a small range of addresses and each address or each location in the register file is referred to as a register. Okay, so that's, that's one additional meaning of the term register. It's a location in a little area of high speed memory that we call the register file. The second time we're going to be referring to registers is when we're talking about configuration registers. This isn't going to be so important in the lectures, but certainly it, this is very important in the hands-on exercises where you're working directly with the AVR processor. So a configuration register is basically a special memory address that we use to configure the peripherals of a microcontroller. So for example, if we want to enable an analog to digital converter, or if we want to specify the period of a timer, we do all this by writing um, binary numbers to special reserved areas in memory that we refer to as, as registers or configuration registers. For the rest of this module, I'm going to talk specifically about the register file. Now, the register file allows us to add a little bit more detail to our microarchitecture design. So you'll recall at the end of the last lecture, we had our, um, we added some more detail regarding our instruction memory. Uh, we know now it's a read-only memory with a special program counter structure that allows us to sequentially cycle through uh, the commands in stored in instruction memory. We also added some detail to the data memory part, specifically you know, the, the write buses, the read buses, the uh, address bus, as well as our very first control line. But in the middle, we had still just this kind of block that we call the processor. Now we're going to start to add some detail to that middle block. And what we're gonna be doing in this module is basically breaking it into two pieces. The first piece is going to be this register file, this small area of high speed memory. And the second piece will be the arithmetic logic unit or ALU. We're gonna get into the ALU in a lot more detail in the coming lectures. But for now, just understand this as a digital block that does calculations on numbers, things like addition, subtraction, and stuff like that. And instructions, and I, I've shown a bunch of kind of vague looking arrows here to indicate the, the flow of information that is possible you know, within our, our microarchitecture. So um, instructions are sometimes, some portions of the instructions are fed directly into the register file. Sometimes portions of the instructions are fed directly into the arithmetic logic unit. Often the output of the register file is fed to the arithmetic logic unit for calculation. Sometimes we bypass the arithmetic logic unit. Often the results of our ALU calculations um, will be written into memory. Sometimes these ALU calculations are fed back into the register file. I didn't even draw that arrow and so on. So um, the point of this is to realize we've now got information flowing sort of all over the place. And so what we're going to do in this module is look very specifically at the functional digital 
block of the register file. So we'll look at, you know, its input buses, its output buses, its control lines. And as we do that, we'll add a little bit more detail or we'll get a little bit more specific regarding how information flows around our design. One of the big uses for the register file or the information stored in the register file is for operands for our machine language instructions. So operands are basically the arguments of our machine language instruction. So for example, if we want to perform an addition operation, we need to know where to get the two numbers um, that we're going to add together. And those two numbers are referred to as the operands. And there are basically two places where these numbers can be stored. The first place is embedded in the machine language instruction itself. So if we embed a number for uh, you know, machine language instruction directly in the machine language um, <laughs> instruction itself, then um, we refer to that as an immediate. That works when we want to add a constant to something because basically when you put a number in the machine language instruction, it's kind of hard coded and so that's a constant. Um, so it works well, for example, if you're looping through a, a loop and you just want to increase your index by one every time. Um, however, often we want to add variable values together that might change during the program execution. And when that happens, those operands are typically stored in the registers inside the register file. So locations in memory inside the register file. So the register file, mo most microcontrollers have registers or register files, uh, most microprocessors, I should say. Um, but we're going to specifically talk about the register file that's used by the AVR. And the AVR register file contains 32 8-bit registers, I should have put 8 bits in there, 32 8-bit registers that are indexed by a 5-bit address, um, right? Because 5 bits are the number of bits you need to ad address 32 different things or 32 different locations. Just as a, a little bit of notation, when you're writing assembly language and you want to specify a register, you use the, the letter R followed by the register number. So the very first register in the register file is R0 or register 0. The second is R1 and so on. Now, in this class, we're going to be looking at both assembly language and the raw binary machine language instructions. When you specify a register inside a binary machine language instruction, you just use the number for that register, right? So R1 is the 5-bit number equal to 1. Now, most of these 32-bit registers are just general purpose registers for storing values that we're using in our calculations, but some of the registers do have special jobs. Um, in particular, at the top of the register file, the, I guess, top six registers are grouped into pairs, and these pairs are used to as 16-bit addresses. So if you'll recall, our data memory uses 16-bit addressing and our registers are only 8 bits. So we need to combine two bits or two registers together. Um, one register holds the lower 8 bits of the uh, data memory address and the second register sh holds the higher uh, of the 8 bits. And we refer to these register pairs as the X pair, the Y pair, and the Z pair. Um, so Registers 26 and 27 are the X pair, 28 and 29 are Y, and 30 and 31 are Z. And as we get into our um, talking about machine language and assembly language a little bit more, you'll see how we, how we use these registers. Also, when you perform a multiplication on the AVR, if you multiply two 8-bit numbers together, the result is actually stored in 16 bits, and the lower byte is stored in R0, and the higher byte is stored in R1. So this is the digital functional block for the register file, and you're going to be seeing this a lot because going forward, this is going to be part of our micro architecture digital design. And if you just look at it, you know, just quickly for the first time, you'll see that it is 
you know, there's some similarities with the data memory block that we designed in the previous lecture. And that makes sense, right? Because a register file is basically just a, another form of memory. So you can think of it as another type of specialized data memory. Um, again, just a lot smaller and a lot higher speed. One of the differences about the register file and data memory is that we actually have not one address bus, but three address buses. These first two, um, A1 and A2, are basically used to specify registers that we want to read from. So the address on uh, address bus A1 specifies the value that shows up on read bus rd1 so we we give the register you know for example if we give a five the five bit number zero zero one zero zero that means that the value contained in register r4 will appear on bus rd1 the address bus a2 specifies the register value that shows up on rd2 and rd2 upper right and so the reason why we've got two read buses for um, the second address bus is to facilitate 16-bit addressing so if you'll remember sometimes we want to use pairs of registers to create a 16-bit number that we can use to um, address a location in data memory RD2 and RD2U or RD2 upper um, facilitates the creation of that 16 bit number. So I'll just clean up my diagram here. Let's say we put the value, um, so let's say the value 26. So 16 plus 8 is 24. Hopefully that's right. So we specify the value 26 on um, A2. The value for register 26 will come out of RD2. And then the value of the next register up, which would be register 27, comes out on RD2 upper. And so this is the X pair of registers. And they're combined together to create a 16-bit number that then is used to address our, our data memory. The third address bus, A3, is used for writing. So the register that we want, if we want to write to a register, we put that register number on A3. And the data that is present on the 8-bit WD3 bus is written to the register that we specify on the A3 address bus, as long as write enable is equal to 1. If write enable is equal to 1, then whatever value on WD3 is written into the register specified by A3 on the rising edge of the next clock. So in that sense, it's very similar to the, the data memory. Now, the reason why we specify we're able to read simultaneously read from two registers and then write to a third is to facilitate sort of typical ALU operations. So for example, if we want to, um, let's say, add registers R2, or sorry, R1 and R2 together, and then store the result in back into R1, then we need to read the value from R1, we need to read the value from R2, and then we need to write the result back into R1. And so we end up using all three of these address buses. A1 would be R1, A2 would be R2, and then A3 would indicate R1. And so um, we would have five bit numbers. Oh, sorry, those are four bit numbers. There we go. 
And so those would be the actual five bit numbers on our address buses. Okay, now we're ready to look at our first machine language instruction. So as we continue to develop our microarchitecture, we're now going to start to look at our 16-bit machine language instructions and design digital logic that can read these machine language instructions and execute them. And so the first machine language instruction I want to look at is the add instruction. So if we were writing this in assembly language, we would type in the word add and then we would indicate the two registers that we want to add together. The add operation only works with registers. And so the first operand in this example is R1. The second operand is R2. And this performs the operation R1 is equal to R1 plus R2. So we read the values from R1 and R2, we add them together, and then we store the result back into R1. All the instructions used by the AVR are 16 bits. And these 16 bits are divided into a series of fields. The first, the first six bits is the op, what we call the op code of the machine language instruction. There has to be a little identifier or a little label on each machine language instruction to tell the microarchitecture which instruction this is. And so the, if the first six bits of a machine language instruction is equal to has a value three, then that tells the microarchitecture that we need to perform an addition operation. The opcode is typically passed up into the control path, and then the control path looks at the opcode, figures out what instruction needs to be performed, and then sets the control lines in the data path accordingly. The remainder of the instruction is used to store the 10 bits that make up our, that specify our two registers, right? So remember, our register numbers are, are each five bits, so we need to use the remaining 10 bits to, to specify our register numbers. You would think that, um, you know, we would have five bits and then five bits, but actually they split um, one of the register numbers up um, for implementation reasons. I'm not sure exactly why, but it must make the digital implementation a little bit easier. And so in the middle of the instruction, bits eight to four, we basically have the five bits that specify R1. And then the lower four bits plus this single bit up here specify R2. So R1 is equal to 0 plus 0001. R2 is equal to 0010. And then the most significant bit up here is, is 0. And you know, again, split up for, for, for implementation reasons. And so now we're kind of at an exciting point in the class because for the first time, we're now able to specify exactly how we would design a microarchitecture to execute the add command. So here we have our instruction memory, our processor block, which consists of the register file and the ALU, and the data memory. So over here, the data memory is just floating around unused. So the add operation doesn't interact with data memory at all. It reads two register values adds them, and then writes the result back to a register. Later on, as we evolve our microarchitecture design, we'll see how we, we connect up to data memory. But for now, we don't need to worry about it. Over here, we have our instruction memory. And this is our 16-bit add machine language instruction. So the program counter has some address instruction address value it happens to currently be pointing to the add, um, the add instruction within instruction memory. And so it's this 16-bit binary instruction that shows up on the RD bus of the, on the read bus of the instruction memory. Now, remember this command implements R1 is equal to R1 plus R2. 
So we need to read from register two. And we do that by taking the ninth bit and the lower four bits from our instruction and creating a five bit word that we feed into address bus A2. That means that the value for register R2 shows up on read bus two. We then take the middle five bits, bits eight to four, and we feed it into um, address bus A1. That means that R1 is going to show up on read bus one. And we take the same five bits and we feed it into address A3. So that means that when our two values are fed into the ALU, which we have configured to do addition, and I'll leave it vague like that for now, but we'll see in later lectures how we do this. Basically, the ALU is going to add these two numbers together, and the result is going to be fed back into the right bus um, because we have the number one on address bus A3. This is going to get written to um, register R1. We enable our write by specifying our control line equal to one. And on the next rising edge of the clock, the result from the addition is written into our register and the addition operation is complete. So obviously this is a very limited design right now. All we can do is add registers together. But I want to emphasize that this is actually a, you know, very basic but fully implemented computer. So we have a program that creates machine language instructions. So we compile our C program or whatever language we're using that is used to generate a bunch of binary machine language instructions that's written into the instruction memory. Our program counter then sort of cycles through our instruction memory addresses and reads out each one. Those machine language instructions are used to specify the registers that we want to add together and the register where we want to store our result. And the ALU is configured to perform addition. So this is our very first machine language command. And so basically what we're going to be doing now going forward is we're going to be adding more and more capability to this microarchitecture to execute more and more commands. So the next thing we're going to do is take kind of a little bit of a detour and focus on the arithmetic logic unit or the ALU. I want to talk about binary numbers, binary addition, how to represent both whole numbers and real numbers using um, things like fixed point and floating point numbers. We're then going to dive into the design of the ALU itself and see how you can build an ALU using the basic sort of combinational logic gates. And then once we've finished all that, we're going to come back to our microarchitecture and start to add the functionality necessary to you know, implement a computer that's actually more useful than just adding two numbers together.